Hi, everyone. I'm Jean Vale, and I have for you today three more short stories by Mark Twain. Uh, remember, these were all written in the latter part of the 19th century. Experience of the McWilliamses with membranous croup, as related to the author of this book by Mr. McWilliams, a pleasant New York gentleman whom the said author met by chance on a journey. Well, to go back to where I was before, I digress to explain to you how that frightful and incurable disease, membranous croup, was ravaging the town and driving all mothers mad with terror. I called Mrs. McWilliam's attention to little Penelope and said, Darling, I wouldn't let that child be chewing that pine stick if I were you. Precious, where is the harm in it, said she, but at the same time preparing to take away the stick, for women cannot receive even the most palpably judicious suggestion without arguing it, that is, married women. I replied, Love, it is a notorious fact that pine is the least nutritious wood that a child can eat. My wife's hand paused in the act of taking the stick and returned itself to her lap. She bridled precipitously and said, Hubby, you know better than that. You know you do. Doctors all say that the turpentine in pine wood is good for weak back and the kidneys. Ah, I was under a misapprehension. I did not know that the child's kidneys and spine were affected and that the family physician had recommended. Who said the child's spine and kidneys were affected? I love you intimated it. The idea. I never intimated anything of the kind. Why, my dear, it hasn't been two minutes since you said. Bother what I said. I don't care what I did say. There isn't any harm in the child's chewing a bit of pine stick if she wants to. And you know it perfectly well. And she shall chew it, too. So there now. Say no more, my dear. I now see the force of your reasoning, and I will go and order two or three cords of the best pine wood today. No child of mine shall want while I, oh, please, go along to your office and let me have some peace. A body can never make the simplest remark, but you must take it up and go to arguing and arguing and arguing till you don't know what you're talking about, and you never do. Very well, it shall be as you say, but there is a want of logic in your last remark, which, however, she was gone with a flourish before I could finish and had taken the child with her. That night at dinner, she confronted me with a face as white as a sheet. Oh, Mortimer, there's another. Little Georgie Gordon is taken. Membranous croup? Membranous croup. Is there any hope for him? None in the wide world. Oh, what is to become of us? By and by, a nurse brought in our Penelope to say good night and offer the customary prayer at her mother's knee. In midst of, now I lay me down to sleep, she gave a slight cough. My wife fell back like one stricken with death, but the next moment she was up and brimming with the activities which terror inspires. She commanded that the child's crib be removed from the nursery to our bedroom and she went along to see the order executed. She took me with her, of course. We got matters arranged with speed. 
a cot bed was put up in my wife's dressing room for the nurse. But now, Mrs. McWilliams said, we were too far away from the other baby, and what if he were to have the symptoms in the night? And she blanched again, poor thing. We then restored the crib and the nurse to the nursery and put up a bed for ourselves in a room adjoining. Presently, however, Mrs. McWilliams said, suppose the baby should catch it from Penelope. This thought struck a new panic to her heart. And the tribe of us could not get the crib out of the nursery again fast enough to satisfy my wife though she assisted in her own person and well nigh pulled the crib to pieces in her frantic hurry. We moved downstairs, but there was no place there to stow the nurse. And Mrs. McWilliams said the nurse's experience would be an inestimable help. So we returned bag and baggage to our own bedroom once more and felt a great gladness like storm-buffeted birds that have found their nest again. Mrs. McWilliams sped to the nursery to see how things were going on there. <clears throat> she was back in a moment with a new dread. She said, what can make baby sleep so? I said, why, my darling, baby always sleeps like a graven image. I know, I know, but there's something peculiar about his sleep now. He seems to, to, he seems to breathe so regularly. Oh, this is dreadful. But my dear, he always breathes regularly. Oh, I know it, but there's something frightful about it now. His nurse is too young and inexperienced. Maria shall stay there with her and be on hand if anything happens. That's a good idea, but who will help you? You can help me all I want. I wouldn't allow anybody to do anything but myself anyhow at such a time as this. I said I would feel mean to lie abed and sleep and leave her to watch and toil over our little patient all the weary night but she reconciled me to it. So old Maria departed and took up her ancient quarters in the nursery. Penelope coughed twice in her sleep. Why don't that doctor come, Mortimer? This room is too warm. This room is certainly too warm. Turn off the register quick. I shut it off glancing at the thermometer at the same time and wondering to myself if 70 was too warm for a sick child. The coachman arrived from downtown now with the news that our physician was ill and confined to his bed. Mrs. McWilliams turned a dead eye upon me and said in a dead voice, there is a providence in it. It is foreordained. He never was sick before, never. We have not been living as we ought to live, Mortimer. Time and time again, I've told you so. Now you see the result. Our child will never get well. Be thankful if you can forgive yourself. I never can forgive myself. I said without intent to hurt, but with heedless choice of words that I could not see that we had been living such an abandoned life. Mortimer, do you want to bring the judgment upon baby too? Then she began to cry, but suddenly exclaimed, the doctor must have sent medicines. I said, certainly they are here. I was only waiting for you to give me a chance. Well, do give them to me. Don't you know that every moment is precious now? But what was the use in sending medicines when he knows that the disease is incurable? I said that while there was life, there was hope. Hope. Mortimer, 
you know no more what you are talking about than the child unborn. If you would, as I live, the directions say give one teaspoonful once an hour. Once an hour? As if we had a whole year before us to save the child in. Mortimer, please hurry. Give the poor perishing thing a tablespoon and try to be quick. Why, my dear, a tablespoonful might. Don't drive me frantic. There, 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 my precious, my own. It's nasty, bitter stuff, but it's good for Nellie, good for mother's precious darling, and it will make her well. There, 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 put the little head on mama's breast and go to sleep. And pretty soon, oh, I know she can't live till morning. Mortimer, a tablespoon every half hour will. Oh, the child needs belladonna, too. I know she does. And aconite. Get them, Mortimer. Now do let me have my way. You know nothing about these things. We now went to bed, placing the crib close to my wife's pillow. All this turmoil had worn upon me, and within two minutes I was something more than half asleep. Mrs. McWilliams roused me. Darling, is that register turned on? No. I thought as much. Please turn it on at once. This room is cold. I turned it on and presently fell asleep again. I was aroused once more. Dearie, would you mind moving the crib to your side of the bed? It is nearer the register. I moved it but had a collision with the rug and woke up the child. I dozed off once more while my wife's quieted the sufferer. But in a little while, the, these words came murmuring remotely through the fog of my drowsiness. Mortimer, if we only had some goose grease, will you ring? I climbed dreamily out and stepped on a cat which responded with a protest and would have got a convincing kick for it if a chair had not got it instead. Now, Mortimer, why do you want to turn up the gas and wake up the child again? Because I want to see how much I'm hurt, Caroline. Well, look at the chair, too. I have no doubt it's ruined. Poor cat. Suppose you had... Now, I'm not going to suppose anything about the cat. It never would have occurred if Maria had been allowed to remain here and attend to these duties, which are in her line and not in mine. Now, Mortimer, I should think you would be ashamed to make a remark like that. It's a pity you cannot do the few little things I ask of you at such an awful time as this. When our child, there, there, I will do anything you want but I can't raise anybody with this bell. They're all gone to bed. Where is the goose grease? On the mantelpiece in the nursery. If you'll step there and speak to Maria. I fetched the goose grease and went to sleep again. Once more I was called. Mortimer, I so hate to disturb you, but the Room is still too cold for me to try to apply this stuff. Would you mind lighting the fire? It is all ready to touch a match to. I dragged myself out and lit the fire and then sat down disconsolate. Mortimer, don't sit there and catch her death of cold. Come to bed. As I was stepping in, she said, Oh, but wait a moment. Please give the child some more of the medicine, which I did. It was a medicine which made a child more or less lively. So my wife made use of its waking interval to strip it and grease it all over with the goose oil. I was soon asleep once more, but once more <clears throat> I had to get up. Mortimer, I feel a draft. I feel it distinctly. 
There is nothing so bad for this disease as a draft. Please move the crib in front of the fire. I did it and collided with the rug again, which I threw in the fire. Mrs. McWilliams sprang out of bed and rescued, and, and we had <coughs> some words. I had another trifling interval of sleep and then got up by request and constructed a flax seed poultice. This was placed upon the child's breast and left there to do its healing work. A wood fire is not a permanent thing. I got up every 20 minutes and renewed ours, and this gave Mrs. McWilliams the opportunity to shorten the times of giving the medicines by 10 minutes, which was a great satisfaction to her. Now and then, between times, I reorganized the flaxseed poultices and applied synapisms and other sorts of blisters where unoccupied places could be found upon the child. Well, toward morning, the wood gave out, and my wife wanted me to go down cellar and get some more. I said, my dear, it is a laborious job, and the child must be nearly warm enough with her extra clothing. Now, might we put on another layer of poultices? And I did not finish because I was interrupted. I logged wood up from below for some little time and then turned in and fell to snoring as only a man can whose strength is all gone and whose soul is worn out. <clears throat> Just as broad daylight, I felt a grip on my shoulder that brought me to my senses suddenly. My wife was glaring down upon me and gasping. As soon as she could command her tongue, she said, it's all over, all over, the child's perspiring. What shall we do? Mercy, how you terrify me. I don't know what we ought to do. Maybe if we scraped her and put her in the draft again. Oh, idiot. There is not a moment to lose. Go for the doctor. Go yourself. Tell him he must come, dead or alive. I drag, dragged that poor sick man from his bed and brought him. He looked at the child and said she was not dying. This was joy unspeakable to me, but it made my wife as mad as if he had offered her a personal affront. Then he said the child's cough was only caused by some trifling irritation or other in the throat. At this, I thought my wife had a mind to show him the door. Now the doctor said it would make the child, he would make the child cough harder and dislodge the trouble. So he gave her something that sent her into a spasm of coughing, and presently up came a little wood splinter or so. This child has no membranous croup, said he. She has been chewing on a bit of pine shingle or something of the kind and got some little slivers in her throat. They won't do her any hurt. No, said I, I can well believe that. Indeed, the turpentine that is in them is very good for certain sorts of diseases that are peculiar to children. My wife will tell you so. But she did not. She turned away in disdain and left the room. And since that time, there is one episode in our life which we never refer to. Hence, the tide of our days flows by in deep and untroubled serenity. Very few married men have such an experience as McWilliams's. And so the author of this book thought that maybe the novelty of it would give it a passing interest to the reader. This next story is called, What Stumped the Blue Jays? Animals talk to each other, of course. 
There can be no question about that, but I suppose there are very few people who can understand them. I never knew but one man who could. I knew he could, however, because he told me so himself. He was a middle-aged, simple-hearted miner who had lived in a lonely corner of California among the woods and mountains a good many years and had studied the ways of his only neighbors, the beasts and the birds, until he believed he could accurately translate any remark which they made. This was Jim Baker. According to Jim Baker, some animals have only a limited education and use only very simple words, and scarcely ever a comparison or a flowery figure, whereas certainly other animals have a large vocabulary, a fine command of language, and a ready and fluent delivery. Consequently, these latter talk a great deal. They like it. They are conscious of their talent, and they enjoy showing off. Baker said that after long and careful observation, he had come to the conclusion that the Blue Jays were the best talkers he had found among birds and beasts, said he. There is more to a Blue Jay than any other creature. He has got more moods and more different kinds of feelings than other creatures, and mind you, Whatever a blue jay feels, he can put into language. And no more commonplace language either, but rattling out and out book talk and bristling with metaphor too, just bristling. As for command of language, why you never see a blue jay get stuck for a word. No man ever did. They just boil over out of him. And another thing, I've noticed a good deal, and, and there's no bird or cow or anything that uses as good grammar as a blue jay. You can say a cat uses good grammar. Well, a cat does. But you let a cat get excited once. You let a cat get to pulling fur with another cat on a shed nights, and you'll hear grammar that will give you the lockjaw. Ignorant people think it's the noise which fighting cats make that is so aggravating. But it ain't so. It's the sickening grammar they use. Now, I've never heard a jay use bad grammar, but very seldom. And when they do, they are as ashamed as a human. They shut right down and leave. You may call a jay a bird. Well, so he is, in a measure, because he's got feathers on him and don't belong to no church, perhaps, but otherwise, he's just as much a human as you be. And I'll tell you why. A jay's gifts and instincts and feelings and interests cover the whole ground. A jay hasn't got any more principle than a congressman. A jay will lie, a jay will steal, a jay will deceive, a jay will betray, and four times out of five, a jay will go back on his solemnest promise. The sacredness of an obligation is a thing which you can't cram into no blue jay's head. Now, on top of all this, there's another thing. A jay can outswear any gentleman in the mines. You think a cat can swear? Well, a cat can, but you give a blue jay a subject that calls for his reserve powers. And <laughs> where's your cat? Don't talk to me. I know too much about this thing. And that there's, yet there's another thing. In the one little particular of scolding, just good clean, out and out scolding. A blue jay can lay over anything, human or divine. Yes, sir. A jay is everything that a man is. 
A J can cry, a J can laugh, a J can feel shame, a J can reason and plan and discuss, a J likes gossip, gossip and scandal, a J's got a sense of humor, a J knows where he is when he is an ass just as well as you do, maybe better. If a J ain't human, he better take in his sign after, that's all. Now I'm going to tell you a perfectly true fact about such blue jays. When I first began to understand jay language correctly, there was a little incident happened here seven years ago. The last man in this region but me moved away. There stands his house, been empty ever since. A big house with a plank roof, just one room and no more, no ceiling, nothing between the rafters and the floor. Well, one Sunday morning, I was sitting out here in front of my cabin with my cat taking the sun and looking at the blue hills and listening to the leaves rustling so lonely in the trees and thinking of the home away yonder in the States that I hadn't heard from in 13 years, when a blue jay lit on that house with an acorn in his mouth and says, hello, I reckon I've struck something. When he spoke, the acorn dropped out of his mouth and rolled down the roof, of course, but he didn't care. His mind was all on the thing he had struck. It was a knot hole in the roof. He cocked his head to one side, shut one eye, and put the other one to the hole like a possum looking down a jug. Then he glanced up with his bright eyes, gave a wink or two with his wings, which signifies gratification, you understand, and says, it looks like a hole. It's located like a hole. Blamed if I don't believe it is a hole. Then he cocked his head down and took another look. He glances up perfectly joyful this time, winks his wings and his tail both, and says, oh no, this ain't no fat thing, I reckon. If I ain't in luck, why, it's a perfectly elegant hole. So he flew down and got that acorn and fetched it up and dropped it in and was just tilting his head back with a heavenliest smile on his face when all of a sudden he was paralyzed into a listening attitude. And that smile faded gradually out of his countenance like breath off a razor. And the queerest look of surprise took its place. Then he says, why, I didn't hear it fall. He cocked his eye at the hole again and took a long look, raised up and shook his head, stepped around to the other side of the hole and took another look from that side, shook his head again. He studied a while. Then he just went into the details, walked round and round the hole and spied into it from every point of the compass. No use. Now he took a thinking attitude on the comb of the roof and scratched the back of his head with his right foot a minute and finally says, well, it's too many for me. That's certain. Must be a mighty long hole. However, I ain't got no time to fool around here. I got to tend to business. I reckon it's all right it anyway. So he flew off and fetched another acorn and dropped it in and tried to flirt his eye to the hole quick enough to see what became of it. But he was too late. He held his eye there as much as a minute. Then he raised up and sighted and says, confound it, I don't seem to understand this thing. No way. However, I'll tackle her again. He fetched another acorn and done his level best to see what become of it, but he couldn't. 
He says, well, I never struck no such hole as this before. I'm of the opinion it's a totally new kind of a hole. Now he began to get mad. He held in for a spell, walking up and down the comb of the roof and shaking his head and muttering to himself, but his feelings got the upper hand of him presently. And he broke loose and cussed himself black in the face. I never see a bird take on so about a little thing. Then he got through. When he got through, he walks to the hole and looks in again for half a minute. Then he says, well, you're a long hole and a deep hole and a mighty singular hole altogether. But I've started to fill it to, I've started in to fill you. And I'm damned if I don't fill you if it takes a hundred years. And with that, away he went. You never see a bird work so since you were born. He laid into his work like a madman, and the way he drove acorns into that hole for about two hours and a half was one of the most exciting and astonishing spectacles, spectacles I ever struck. He never stopped to take a look anymore. He just hove them in and went for more. Well, at last, he could hardly flop his wings. He was so tuckered out. He comes a-drooping down once more, sweating like an ice pitcher, drops his acorn in and says, Now, I guess I've got the bulge on you by this time. So he went down for a look. If you'll believe me, when his head come up again, he was just pale with rage. He says, I've shoveled acorns enough in there to keep the family 30 years. And if I can see the sign of one, I wish I may land in a museum with a belly full of sawdust in two minutes. He just had strength enough to crawl up on the comb and lean his back against the chimney. And then he collected his impressions and begun to free his mind. I see in a second that what I had mistook for profanity in the minds was only just the rudiments, as you may say. Another Jay was going by and heard him doing his <clears throat> devotions and stops to inquire what was up. The sufferer told him the whole circumstance and says, now yonder, yonder's the hole, and if you don't believe me, go and look for yourself. So this fellow went and looked and comes back and says, how many did you say you put in there? Not any less than two tons, says the sufferer. The other Jay went and looked again. <clears throat> he couldn't seem to make it out, so he raised a yell, and three more jays came. They all examined the hole. They all made the sufferer tell it over again. Then they all discussed it and got off as many leather-headed opinions about it as an average crowd of humans could have done. They called in more jays, then more and more, till plenty soon this whole region appeared to have blue flush about it. There must have been 5,000 of them. And such another jawing and disputing and ripping and cussing you never heard. Every jay in the whole lot put his eye to the hole and delivered a more chuckle-headed opinion about the mystery than the jay that went there before him. They examined the house all over, too. The door was standing half-opened and at last, one old jay happened to go and light on it and looked in. Of course, that knocked the mystery galley west in a second. There lay the acorns, scattered all over the floor. He flopped his wings and raised a hoop. Come here, he says, come here, everybody. Hanged if this fool hasn't been filling trying to fill up a house with acorns. They all came a swooping down like a blue cloud, and 
as each fellow lit on the door and took a glance, the whole absurdity of the contract that that first Jay had tackled hit him home and he fell over backward, suffocating with laughter. And then next Jay took his place and done the same. Well, sir, they roosted around here on the housetop and the trees for an hour and guffawed over that thing like human beings. It ain't any use to tell me a blue jay hasn't got a sense of humor, because I know better. And memory, too. They brought jays here from all over the United States to look down that hole every summer for three years. Other birds, too. And they could all see the point except an owl who come from Nova Scotia to visit the Yosemite. And he took this thing in on his way back. He said he couldn't see anything funny in it. But then he was a good deal disappointed about Yosemite, too. My last story is called The Professor's Yarn. It was in the early days. I was not a college professor then. I was a humble-minded young land surveyor with a world before me to survey in case anybody wanted it done. I had a contract to survey a route for a great mining ditch in California, and I was on my way thither by sea a three or four weeks voyage. There were a good many passengers, but I had very little to say to them. Reading and dreaming were my passions, and I avoided conversation in order to indulge these appetites. There were three professional gamblers on board, rough, repulsive fellows. I never had any talk with them, yet I could not help seeing them with some frequency for they gambled in an upper deck stateroom every day and night, and in my promenades I often had glimpses of them through their door, which stood a little ajar to let out the surplus tobacco smoke and profanity. <clears throat> they were an evil and hateful presence, but I had to put up with it, of course. There was one other passenger who fell upon my eye a good deal, for he seemed determined to be friendly with me, and I could not have gotten rid of him without running some chance of hurting his feelings, and I was far from wishing to do that. Besides, there was something engaging in his countrified simplicity and his beaming good nature. The first time I saw this Mr. John Bacchus, I guessed from his clothes and his looks that he was a grazier or farmer from the backwoods of some western state, doubtless Ohio. And afterward, when he dropped into his personal history and I discovered that he was a cattle raiser from interior Ohio, I was so ple pleased with my own penetration that I warmed toward him, verifying my instinct. <clears throat> he got to dropping alongside me every day after breakfast to help me make my promenade, so in the course of time, his easy working jaw had told me everything about his business, his prospects, his family, his relatives, his politics, in fact, everything that concerned Bacchus, living or dead. In the meantime, I think he had managed to get out of me everything I knew about my trade, my tribe, my purposes, my prospects, and myself. He was a gentle and persuasive genius, and this thing showed it, for I was not given to talking about my matters. I said something about triangulation once. The stately word pleased his ear. He inquired what it meant. I explained. After that, he quietly and inoffensively ignored my name and always called me 
triangle. What an enthusiast he was in cattle. At the bare name of a bull or a cow, his eye would light and his eloquent tongue would turn itself loose. As long as I would walk and listen, he would walk and talk. He knew all breeds. He loved all breeds. He caressed them all with his affectionate tongue. I tramped along in voiceless misery while the cattle question was up. When I could endure it no longer, I used to deftly insert a scientific topic into the conversation. Then my eye fired and his faded. My tongue fluttered. His stopped. Life was a joy to me and a sadness to him. One day he said, a little hesitatingly, and with somewhat of diffidence, Triangle, would you mind coming down to my stateroom a minute and have a little talk on a certain matter? I went with him at once. Arrived there, he put his head out, glanced up and down the saloon warily, then closed the door and locked it. We sat down on the sofa, and he said, I'm going to make a little proposition to you, and if it strikes you favorable, it'll be a middling good thing for both of us. You ain't a-going out to California for fun, neither am I. It's business, ain't that so? Well, you can do me a good turn, and so can I you if we see fit. I've raked and scraped and saved a considerable many years, and I've got it all here. He unlocked an old hair trunk, tumbled a chaos of shabby clothes aside, and drew a short, stout bag into view for a moment, then buried it again and relocked the trunk. Dropping his voice to a cautious, low tone, he continued, she's all there, around 10,000 in yellow boys. Now, this is my little idea. What I don't know about raising cattle ain't worth knowing. There's mints of money it in California. Well, I know and you know that's all along a line that's being surveyed. There's little dabs of land that they call gores that fall to the survey free, gratis, for nothing. All you've got to do on your side is to survey in such a way that the gorse will fall on good fat land. Then you turn them over to me. I stock them with cattle, enrolls the cash. I plank out your share of the dollars regular right along, and I was sorry to wither his blooming enthusiasm, but it could not be helped. I interrupted and said severely, I am not that kind of a surveyor. Let us change the subject, Mr. Backus. <clears throat> it was pitiful to see his confusion and hear his awkward and shame-faced apologies. I was as much distressed as he was, especially as he seemed so far from having suspected that there was anything improper in his proposition. So I hastened to console him and lead him on to forget his mishap in a conversational orgy about cattle and butchery. We were lying at Acapulco, and as we went on deck, deck it happened, luckily, that the crew was just beginning to hoist some beeves aboard in slings. Bacchus's melancholy vanished instantly, and with it the memory of his late mistake. Now only look at that, cried he. My goodness, Triangle, what would they say to it in Ohio? Wouldn't their eyes bug out to see them handled like that? Wouldn't they, though? All the passengers were on deck to look, even the gamblers, and Bacchus knew them all and had afflicted them all with his pet topic. <clears throat> As I moved away, I saw one of the gamblers approach and accost him, then another of them, then the third. 
I halted, waited, watched. The conversation continued between the four men. It grew earnest. Back as it drew gradually away, the gamblers followed and kept at his elbow. I was uncomfortable. However, as they passed me presently, I heard Bacchus say with a tone of persecuted annoyance, but it ain't any use, gentlemen, I tell you again, as I've told you a half dozen times before, I weren't raised to it and I ain't a going to risk it. I felt relieved. His level head will be his sufficient perfect protection, I said to myself. During the fortnight's run from Acapulco to San Francisco, I several times saw the gamblers talking earnestly with Bacchus. Once I threw out a gentle warning to him. He chuckled comfortably and said, oh yes, they tag around after me considerable, want me to play a little just for amusement, they say. But laws of me, if my folks have told me once to look out for that sort of Livestock, they've told me a thousand times, I reckon. By and by, in due course, we were approaching San Francisco. <clears throat> it was an ugly black night with a strong wind blowing, but there was not much sea. I was on deck alone. Toward 10, I started below. A figure issued from the gambler's den and disappeared in the darkness. I experienced a shock for I was sure it was Bacchus. I flew down the companionway, looked about for him, could not find him, then returned to the deck just in time to catch a glimpse of him as he re-entered that confounded nest of rascality. Had he yielded at last? I feared it. What had he gone below for? His bag of coin? Possibly. I drew near the door, full of bodings. It was a crack, and I glanced in and saw a sight that made me bitterly wish I had given my attention to saving my poor cattle friend instead of reading and dreaming my foolish time away. He was gambling. Worse still, he was being plied with champagne and was already showing some effect from it. He praised the cider, as he called it, and said now that he had got a taste of it, he almost believed he would drink it if it was spirits. It was so good and so ahead of anything he had ever run across before. Surreptitious smiles at this passed from one rascal to another, and they filled all the glasses, and while Bacchus honestly drained his to the bottom, they pretended to do the same, but threw the wine over their shoulders. I could not bear the scene, so I wandered forward and tried to interest myself in the sea and the voices of the wind, but no, my uneasy spirit kept dragging me back at quarter-hour intervals, and always I saw Bacchus drinking his wine, fairly and squarely, and the others throwing theirs away. It was the painfulest night I ever spent. The only hope I had was that we might reach our anchorage with speed, and that would break up the game. I helped the ship along all I could with my prayers. At last we went booming through the Golden Gate, and my pulses leaped for joy. I hurried back to that door and glanced in. Alas, there was small room for hope. Bacchus's eyes were heavy and bloodshot. His sweaty face was crimson, his speech maudlin and thick. His body sawed drunkenly about with the weaving motion of the ship. He drained another glass to the dregs while the cards were being dealt. He took his hand glanced at it, and his dull eyes lit up for a moment. The gamblers observed it and showed their gratification by hardly perceptible signs. How many cards? None, said Bacchus. One villain, named Hank Wiley, discarded one card. 
the others three each. The betting began. Heretofore, the bets had been trifling, a, a dollar or two, but Bacchus started off with an eagle now. Wiley hesitated a moment, then saw it, and went ten dollars better. The other two threw up their hands. Bacchus went twenty better. Wiley said, I see that and go you a hundred better, then smiled and reached for the money. Let it alone, said Bacchus with drunken gravity. What, you mean to say you're going to cover it? Cover it? Well, I reckon I am and lay another hundred on top of it too. He reached down inside his overcoat and produced the required sum. Oh, that's your little game, is it? I see your raise and raise it 500, said Wiley. 500 better, said the foolish bull driver, and pulled out the amount and showered it on the pile. The three conspirators hardly tried to conceal their exultation. All diplomacy and pretense were dropped now, and the sharp exclamations came thick and fast and the yellow pyramid grew higher and higher. At last, $10,000 lay in view. Wiley cast a bag of coin on the table and said with mocking gentleness, $5,000 better, my friend, from the rural districts. What do you say now? I call you, said Bacchus, heaving his golden shot bag on the pile. What have you got? Four kings, you lip fool, said Wiley, threw down his cards and surrounded the stakes with his arms. Four aces, you ass, thundered Bacchus, covering his man with a cocked revolver. I am a professional gambler myself, and I've been laying for you duffers all this voyage. Down went the anchor, rumbly dum dum, and the trip was ended. Well, well, it is a sad world. One of the three gamblers was Bacchus's pal. It was he that dealt the fateful hands. According to an understanding with the two victims, he was to have given Bacchus four queens. But alas, he didn't. A week later, I stumbled upon Bacchus, arrayed in the height of fashion in Montgomery Street. He said cheerily as we were parting, Ah, by the way, you needn't mind about those gores. I really don't know anything about cattle, except what I was able to pick up in a week's apprenticeship over in Jersey just before we sailed. My cattle culture and cattle enthusiasm have served their turn. I shan't need them anymore. That was from Life on the Mississippi, written in 1883. <laughs> A witty, witty writer. 